Hello. First of all, Magic, I, I want to welcome everyone to my Financial Services Brain Trust on Wealth Building. I'm so delighted you're here for this virtual discussion with our very special guest. As the first African-American and first woman to chair the House Financial Services Committee, um, I've made addressing the wealth gap one of my top priorities in Congress. And, you know, as an extension of that work, um, you know, I have over the last several years have taken this opportunity during the CBCF Legislative Conference uh, to invite celebrity business owners to share uh, with our audience how they became successful and how they obtained capital and what lessons they learned along the way that can help aspiring African American entrepreneurs. Now, as you can see, we're not in the Washington Convention Center because today's Brain Trust, like all other public events, has to be conducted online to keep everyone safe. So despite the fact we cannot be together as we normally would, I think you're going to enjoy who we have with us today. I'm so very pleased to introduce NBA legend and iconic businessman, Urban Magic Johnson. Having left the basketball court for the boardroom, Urban Magic Johnson has successfully parlayed his skills from the court into the business world as chairman and CEO of Magic Johnson Enterprises. Provides, they provide uh, products and services focusing primarily on ethnically diverse and underserved communities. Magic Johnson made history in 2012 when he became co-owner of Major League Baseball, Los Angeles Dodgers. He also co-owns the Los Angeles Sparks of the N WNBA, Major League Soccer's Los Angeles Football Club, and eSports franchise Team Liquid. Magic continues to expand his influence through his many businesses that include Equitrust, Life Insurance Company, and Sodexo Magic, a food services and facilities management company. Magic, I want to thank you for all you have done to support our community and for being such an extraordinary role model, not just for the people in Los Angeles, but for people all over this country who can see what is successful and what a successful company uh, can do and own interest in many lucrative enterprises that are creating jobs and economic opportunities in our community. I'm very appreciative for you. And of course, I know you just celebrated uh, your birthday one day before mine and that you're so busy. You could be anywhere in the world right now or spending time with your family. Uh, so I must say to our audience, this is not the first time uh, that you have graced us with your presence. Over the years, I think this is your third time and on the other two times, you got on the plane and flew from Los Angeles to be with us, and we didn't even pay your airfare. <laughs> so I can't wait to talk to you about your career, your success, how your companies have navigated challenges created by the coronavirus pandemic, including the LA Dodgers, the LA Sparks, and what you're looking forward to in 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome L.A. Lakers NBA legend turned mogul, Irvin Magic Johnson. Well, well oh. thank, thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, I just, you know, I love you to death. And you and I have worked on so many different projects to enhance, enhance uh, whether that's in Los Angeles, uh, the black and brown community, whether that's the state of California, and so, and then the country. And so I'm so proud of you and what you're doing for, for all of us in the United States of America. You, you made the country better. And then it's all about, for me, making sure that I enhance the black community across this country and give also some smart and incredible, talented black folks opportunities to work for my company. And, and it's been very successful because of those talented black people who I've hired. And uh, so I'm happy. And then last but not least, let me just say hello from Cookie. You know, she oh. 
tell you hello. So, <laughs> so I got that in because I can't go home unless I say, I told Maxine, <laughs> hi, honey. <laughs> you know, I just love your wife. She's such a wonderful woman, a spiritual woman. And yeah. every time I'm around her, I feel like I want to be a better person. <laughs> so tell Cookie I said hello. <laughs> I will, I will, for sure. Well, thank you. Well, let me begin, if you don't mind, with your basketball career. The NBA characterizes you as one of the 50 greatest players, I suppose, uh, you know, anytime, any place, anywhere. And so um, how do you feel, uh, you know, you're certainly in the league's history. You have five NBA championships, an NCAA championship, an Olo Olympic gold medal, and you're one of only seven players in the history of the sport to claim all of those victories. The NBA says you revolutionize what it means to be a point guard. At what point in your career did you realize you were really as good as people describe? Was there a moment <laughs> in particular, a game or a victory that you thought to yourself, hey, I'm really good at this game? <laughs> well, let me start. Uh, I, I owe everything to my parents, right? My mother and father stressed uh, education. They stressed values and uh, they actually set the tone for myself and my six sisters and three brothers. My father uh, worked for General Motors for 30 years. My mother worked at the school cafeteria and no matter what, they were all about the family and making sure that we all the decisions that we made were the right decisions, right? And so um, I would have to say I owe most of the credit in terms of me being a great basketball player to my parents, watching games with my father on Saturdays and Sundays. Then my own work ethic, because it was about uh, applying myself every single day, every single night, uh, trying to work on my game to get better. So I won the state high school championship in Michigan. I went to Michigan State. I've always wanted to go there. And I led that school, had never won a national championship to uh, the NCAA championship, beating my arch rival, Larry Bird, in his <laughs> Indian State team. <laughs> and so I, I thought, I said, okay, I, I'm pretty good. I, I won two, I won high school championship. I won now the NCAA championship. And uh, now I get drafted by the Lakers. And so, that, for me, actually changed my life. So I'm so happy that I came to Los Angeles and I was able to come on a team where they had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And so I think when we won the uh, NBA championship my rookie season and uh, Kareem got hurt, remember, in game six, uh, and he couldn't play, and we were up 3-2. We were flying to Philadelphia, and uh, Maxine, all, all the guys on the Laker team thought that uh, we were not going to beat Philadelphia without Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He was the MVP of, of the league that year. And I came to the airport, and I said, well, what's wrong? Everybody's head was down, and they said, well, have you heard Kareem can't play? I said, so what? We still going to win. Ooh. And they were like, Rookie, go sit down. We can't beat <laughs> Philadelphia without Kareem. So I had to think of something to do. As leaders, we always have to think of something to do to change those who are working with mindset so they can get into a winning mindset instead of a losing mindset. So I asked the stewardess, Kareem would always sit in the first seat. So I said, can I go on the plane first because I want to sit in the first seat? And she said, sure. So as every Laker came and came by me, I said, never fear, magic is here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, this guy is crazy, right? So I had five hours to work on that mindset and attitude about thinking that we can beat Philadelphia without our best player. We, we fly all the way to Philly. I told him we were going to win. The next day, sure enough, we beat Philadelphia without Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And that guy named Magic Johnson, you know, he had 42 points, 15 rebounds, and seven assists. So I became the first rookie in NBA history to ever win the NBA Finals MVP. And so that's when I knew 
that I was pretty good. And to go on to win four more championships and do all the things we were able to accomplish, I'm, I'm really proud of that. Wow, what a what a what an inspiring story and the kind of confidence that you instilled in them simply by saying, you know, you were there. Is yes. that when you got the name Magic or that was the, after? I, um, when did you get the name Magic? I got the name Magic. I went to a school that wasn't known for basketball. Bussing had came into Lansing, Michigan. And I was, I lived on the west side where all the blacks live. And so I always went to an all black school and I had won every championship. So now I'm about to go to the school that was ranked high every single year in basketball, Sexton High School, that 10 minute walk from my house. But busing came in, so I got bused across town to an all white school and they were not known for basketball. So the first three weeks, I gotta take you through that first. They were fighting every day. We didn't want to be there. They didn't want us there. And so the next Monday, the principal was waiting for the bus. And he jumped on the bus as soon as we arrived at Everett High School. And he said, Irvin Johnson, come to my office. So I'm thinking, Maxine, I, 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 I did something wrong. I, <laughs> I'm like, oh, man, the principal that called me out in front of all the kids? So we get to his office, and he said, Irvin, you're going to stop all the black students from fighting. And we had a, he had a white football player there. And he said, you're going to stop all the white students from, from fighting. And I said, why, why are you choosing me? I just got to high school. I'm only 15 years old. Why don't you choose a senior? Because they won't listen to them, but they'll listen to you. So I went into the auditorium, and I told the kids, hey, we got to be here. We got to get our education. Nothing's going to change. So let's figure out how to uh, work with students who don't look like us. And sure enough, fighting did stop. And basketball came right behind. A couple months later, basketball season started. So what happened was they picked us to come in last place. We got off to an 8-0 start, shocked everybody in the state of Michigan, Everett High School undefeated. We went to go play a school that was supposed to be a, the, one of the best high schools in, in uh, the state of Michigan, and we blew them out on their home court. And I had 38 <laughs> points, 20 rebounds, and 19 assists. So that was my first triple-double in high school. And the sports writer came in and said, man, I got to give you a nickname. He said, somebody's already called Big E. Somebody's already called Dr. J. I want to call you Magic. So wow. that's my nickname. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that is fantastic. And I have to tell you uh, that when Cookie put her book out and I saw how well that worked, she said, I believe in magic. And I thought, oh, this is fabulous. I mean, it couldn't have yeah. had a better title. So magic, that name has served you well yes, for a yes. long time. Yes, it has. What are you most proud of uh, that you accomplished in the NBA? I think just the fact that uh, we went to the finals nine times in 12 years, um, that I made my teammates better and they made me better, uh, that I played for only one franchise, um, that I was able to really change the way, you know, they said, oh, a 6'9 guy can't play point guard. So I think to change the game. And then last but not least, this is very important. When both Larry Bird and I came in, remember the ratings were really low. People were not watching the NBA. So between the two of us, we actually made the NBA popular. And so I think I'm proud of that too, that the games went from uh, being on tape delayed to live TV and uh, more fans were tuning in. And so I'm, I'm really proud of that too. Wow, that's great. Well, let us, let us move on uh, to your entrepreneurship. What was the first investment you ever made? And what would you say is the best investment you ever made? Um, the first investment was uh, back when I first was the rookie. That's when minorities could buy radio stations and TV stations for less money with uh, 
what uh, I can't remember what it was called. You had this credit that if a minority bought it, they could buy it for less money. So I bought a radio station in Denver, Colorado, and uh, it was an AM station. And we kept it long enough so we can uh, make it an FM station because FMs were more valuable at that time. And sure enough, uh, we sold it for a nice profit. I was very happy about that. So that was my first investment. But the best investment, I feel, was Starbucks because oh. it proved to everybody that, first of all, you can make money in the black community because you know we had to get rid of that myth that you, you couldn't make money in our community. Um, and what was so unique about it was when I first bought Starbucks, there was an article, I think in the LA Times or somewhere, and said, no way minorities gonna pay $3 for a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't pay $3 for a cup of coffee. We quite don't eat scones. So I had to take the scones out of my Starbucks and put in sweet potato pie, peach cobbler, <laughs> sake to me cake. And that's why my per caps were actually higher than his per caps. And then I had to take out that elevator music that was playing and put in <laughs> Lionel Richie, Prince, Michael Jackson, but Beyonce. So what am I saying to you? I know my customer. See, if I had to kept the scones in, I wouldn't have made as much money. So you take out things that don't resonate with the black community and the Latino community, and you put in things that do resonate. And that's why my per caps were so high. And when I got you into my Starbucks, you lounged, you stayed there for hours because it became a meeting place too. Because our biggest challenge in the black community is that we don't have meeting places that we can meet our boy or your girlfriend or your, your, your family member. But those Starbucks became that meeting place. So also I over delivered by making those changes, you over delivered to the customer. And then they keep coming back and coming back and coming back if you over deliver to them. And if the building is clean and if they get the hot coffee and so we, we were able to do all those things. Well, I bet that was a learning experience for all of the Starbucks, uh, you know, board and uh, yep. investors, you know, that you understood the culture of your community and you knew how to apply it. That's a wonderful lesson for everybody. Don't try and, you know, do somebody else's thing. Do your own thing. That's, That's right. Great. You're so, exactly right. Magic Johnson Enterprises. Um, explain to us more about that, how you started the company and how uh, you grew it over time. Great, great question. Um, I started the company because I looked at the spending power of African Americans. If you look now, we, we got about a $1.5 trillion spending power. Latinos about a $1.5 or $6 trillion spending power. So I looked and said, man, that's $3 trillion that nobody was going after. So I said, that's a lot of disposable income that if I build it and build it right, they will come. So I started off doing research. What's the number one thing that we, we like or, or we would want to do in our own community? My research showed us that it's family. Everybody said, I want to do something with my family. So I went and built Magic Johnson Theaters, that's the first thing I did. I went and did a joint venture with Sony. They own Lowe's Theaters. And we did a deal, my first theater, which was in Los Angeles, you and I opened together. Yes. And uh, it came in the top 10 highest grossing theaters in the nation. Wow. In the first year. So that really got me started. I built six other theaters before AMC came in and bought us all out. Then I did the deal with Starbucks. We built 125 Starbucks in 40 different cities across the country. Um, I sold all those Starbucks back to Howard. Now he's built thousands in the inner city. I opened up that, that marketplace for him. And then from there, I went and, and did a deal with Sodexo called, and it, my company's called Sodexo Magic. So we feed, 
high school students, or, or I should say K through 12, uh, we on college campuses. I feed the, the kids on at Grambling, Jackson State, Morgan State, Central State, you know, on and on and on, but also at big corporations like Toyota. Um, so I have over 100 clients all over the country, Merck, on and on and on. And so oh, wow. I'm, I'm very happy about the growth. We're going to be over a billion dollars here pretty soon. And so we're just doing outstanding. And so that's a very successful business. But what I really like, Maxine, is that over 70% of my employees are black. Wow. Yes, we're putting a lot of people to work. Uh, and so I'm really proud of that. And we were working even even right now and in, in when COVID first hit. See, we couldn't afford to stop feeding those kids because they're poor, we, you know, in poor communities. So we were still, we had frontline workers still working, feeding those kids two meals a day. Because if those kids, if we would have stopped, those kids wouldn't have had breakfast or lunch. So they rely heavily and their parents rely on us feeding those kids. So even during the, during the pandemic, and it's still going on now, we were feeding the kids. And so I'm, I'm so proud of my workers. And I want to say thank you to them and their families for allowing, allowing their parents, their father, mother to still come and cook food so that we could feed all those school districts. Uh, Washington, D.C., I got school districts in Michigan, on and on and on. So we were taking care of those schools even during these challenging times. And then the biggest thing I have probably to date is uh, Equitrust. Uh, we're, when I bought it, we were 14 billion. Now uh, we've, we've had it for four years. We're at 20 billion and growing. It's a, a, a really successful business, successful company. And most of my uh, executives, again, are black. And so we're, exact, we're happy about what we've been able to build and grow. Um, I'm in the infrastructure business, so my company's called Johnson Loop Capital, partnered with a guy named Jim Reynolds, uh, African-American young man out of Chicago, and we won uh, the LaGuardia Airport. We've already rebuilt the Delta Terminal there. We won Kennedy Airport. Though, both of those deals are about $4 billion a, a piece, and then the Denver Airport as well. So we've been doing a fabulous job with our, our new infrastructure company. And we're looking forward to more winning more RFPs around the country. And then I'm into all the sports teams, as you mentioned. So <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, you've got your hands full. Yes, I do. <laughs> a lot to think about. And um, wow, I'm so proud of you and the way that you have learned to not just keep it all for yourself, uh, but to share and to give and to support. And that's so important. And that is, you know, a great role model uh, for all of our successful athletes and entertainers and others. Uh, if they take a look at what you have done, I hope uh, they can be inspired uh, to take the same path because well, it's so very, very important. Let me and, thank you. Uh, when you talk about wonderful employees that you've been able to work with, you know I keep up with uh, Eric Holloman. Yes. yes. Uh, and I say, I, I know if I want to find magic, I've got <laughs> to get to Eric. And so he's a wonderful, wonderful young man. And you know, I knew his family very yeah. well. Yes. I knew Frank. Uh, I think Frank was his uncle. Yeah. And uh, you know, he has a great business mind. And uh, so I know if you have employees like him and people that you're working with like him, uh, that that does very well for all of your enterprises. Thank well, you. I, you know, Maxine, you, you take a guy like Eric who started off as my employee and now he's my business partner who runs all my businesses now. Woo. And um, you, you think about, there are so many talented African-Americans out here in the marketplace and I get so frustrated when corporations tell me, well, I can't find a black engineer or I can't mm -hmm. find this. And I said, no, you're lying. 
That's not true. We mm -hmm. have talented people in every industry, in every sector, but you use that as the excuse. So we can't let them use that anymore as the excuse because I found everything that I'm looking for, mm -hmm. I've always found it. And, wow. and, and we can find hundreds and just, just uh, the other day, Sodexo Magic, we're looking for a, a business development person. We put it out online. We had over 200 qualified candidates who were black. So Ooh. you can't tell me you can't find quality people. So, so we know that there's talent out there. And uh, I'm so happy to say that Eric has done an amazing job. But I want to thank you because it was three people who first changed my life. Maxine Waters, <laughs> oh. Ron, Ron Brown, <laughs> oh my and God. Don Mack in oh Los Angeles. <laughs> right? Ron Brown is now dead. He was an incredible mentor to me. You have been, you've always said, Irvin, you got to get involved in the city. You got to get, we got to bring people up and you got to give back. So the scholarships and all the things that we do, you and I have done so many great things together. So it was your mentorship and working with me to teach me, to help me understand how important my voice and my platform is to make change within the black community. So I want to thank you for that because, and then Earl Graves helped me so much and another brother named Bruce Llewellyn helped me out a lot. So oh, I got yeah, to give credit Bruce, to yeah. all of you guys. So thank you, my love. Wow. For helping me and point me in the right direction. That's so kind and gracious of you to say that. Um, and, you know, I served on a board with Bruce Llewellyn. You guys were way ahead of your time in terms of thinking about business and serving on that essence board with Bruce. Boy, yeah. did I learn a lot. And it was <laughs> not easy because, you know, he was not so nice. That's right. <laughs> and so he didn't try to mince words or anything no. and, uh, but that's the kind of learning uh, that i think is so important to our growth but for you i can remember uh, how i first felt when i would every time i've introduced you uh, in the community at some project uh, and see the look on the face of these young people as they listen to you and they look at you and understand what is possible so I want to thank you so very much. And Magic, I just want to ask you, given all of this success, did you run into any barriers at all? Or was it because uh, you were Magic and you had demonstrated your leadership and your brilliance uh, you know, in sports that you didn't have some of the barriers uh, that maybe others encountered? Did you have any barriers at all? Yes, I did. That was a great, this is a great question. So. When I first got started, I used my money and the money that I've earned from the Lakers. But that could only take me so far because I wanted growth, I wanted sustainability. And if I wanted those two things, I had to use other people's money. So when I went to the banks, the first six or seven turned me down, right? They said, oh, Magic, we want to meet you. We want your autograph. We want to take a picture <laughs> with you. But we will not invest in you and your business plan and your business thesis for urban America. Wow. So, but I, I, I didn't get discouraged. I just went to the next one, right? Yeah. True enough, that last one said yes. Okay. And I said, okay. And this is really interesting because in, institutional capital was not ready for urban America to invest. Cal Purr said, I'm going to give you $50 million. And if you can over deliver with the 50 million, you can come back and get a hundred more million. So <clears throat> I said, okay, I bought the Ladera shopping center for $22 million. You know where that is in Los yes, Angeles. Yes, of course. And it was only 40% occupied at that time. I took it to a hundred percent occupied. I resold the center for 48 million. I took the 26 million up to Cal Purs and dropped the check to him and said, see, <laughs> I know business and you got a nice return on your investment. And sure enough, that's what got me started. So 
I want people to know I got turned down a lot, even though I was Magic Johnson and all that. But when somebody said yes, I made sure I was very successful and I made sure that I returned a nice, heavy return on their investment in me so that they can say, okay, now let's give him more money. And I became one of the first ones invested in urban America. That was ooh, a long time ago, almost 35 years ago. And uh, so I just took off from there. So I did have some op obstacles, but it was okay because I proved to them that I knew business. And the main thing is this, for all these entrepreneurs who are listening, you have to have a track record of success. Once you get a track record of success, now those financial institutions will look at you a little different and be inclined to give you a loan or give you money. Until I proved to them that I knew business, they turned me down just like they were turning anybody else down. So, wow. Um, not only did you prove to them uh, that you knew business, and you was making money for them, um, you know, and that's what, uh, you know, purrs and stirs and all of that. They have a fiduciary responsibility, but they were not investing in our community until you came along. Yeah. And yep. so... I know that story well. I'm, <laughs> I'm so very pleased that you were there. Yeah. Listen, I want to kind of uh, wrap up, but I know that we can't, uh, you know, we can't, uh, you know, stop this conversation without saying a word about the coronavirus. Right. And, you know, I know that it presents a challenge to all of your companies. You know, this pandemic is something that you have to rethink you know, how things work and how things operate and how you're going to get people to do what needs to be done. So um, did you have to do anything special? What did your people tell you about what they were doing uh, to get people, you know, understanding all of the new rules of how they had to operate? Well, let me, let me first also thank all my employees who work at hospitals that I have contracts at. Uh, I have Newark and Miami on and on and on. We get, so we had to, first of all, keep them safe. That's the number one thing, safety, safety, and more safety, if I could stress that. And once we proved and showed them that we could keep them safe as employees, they were very happy to go to work. So we were able to do that. Um, then we had to make changes because of the uh, coronavirus, yes because some of my business still perform well. Some of them, we, we lost revenue. And so we had to make an adjustment because um, people said, hey, we can't honor the contract we had because we're losing money. And so that made me lose money. And so, but that's okay. That's, that's the part of it. So what we did was we said, okay, well, let's focus on how we can get ready for the next year, which is coming up because there's nothing we can do about this year. And so um, we have made the necessary changes. We all been working from home. Uh, I'm a guy that just can't work from home only. I, I love being in the office, so I come in anyway. And <laughs> so, and you know, I got calls. I still gotta keep in touch with my employees and investors and so, um, but my staff, they, they're working from home. And, um, but what I'm really happy about is that it's only been a couple companies that suffered and not my whole portfolio. And so, uh, but we had to, in my office, we had to put up, you know, different, the glass and different things, make sure people were six feet apart and those whole things. And we've done that. And so we've taken the necessary steps to make sure my employees will be safe uh, but we're quick and nimble. We've always been able to adjust whatever the marketplace is. We can adjust to that. And, uh, and we've done that. And now when you look at all the sports teams that I own, there's no fans. So the Dodgers is, is weird to go to the Dodger stadium and it's 50. We have about 54,000 seats 
and <laughs> there's nobody there. That you know, has to be weird. <laughs> that's that's just strange. But we we have the best record in baseball, so I'm happy about that. Uh, the Sparks, we're down in Orlando in the bubble. We we have the second best record in the WNBA, so I'm happy about that. Our soccer team, we got this beautiful new stadium. Again, no fans. So when I think about all the revenue that we we that we've been losing with the sports teams because of no fans, right? And so that's a lot of that's a lot of money. But at the same time, we still getting the TV deal money, and so we're we're not doing good, great, but we're not doing bad either. So we're right in the middle of that. So I'm just happy and proud that the players decide to play, and that we're able to still entertain those people who are at home uh, and they can still watch baseball, uh, women's basketball and soccer. And of course, I'm still a Laker fan. So I watch the NBA like crazy. Wow. Wow. Well, I guess, and I suppose in business, that's one of the things you have to do. And that is be prepared for changes that you didn't anticipate and be able to meet them and deal with them. And this is one of the biggest that any company has had to face in our country. And so I have an appreciation for what you're describing. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, as we move toward our wrap up here, I know that you made a big announcement uh, when we were involved um, in Washington, D.C. in responding to the pandemic, to our families and to our communities, to our governments, et cetera, around the country. And we had uh, the CARES Act was the first a big response that we had. And of course, we had the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. And I think we stumbled a little bit in the beginning. And then we uh, had a supplemental uh, appropriation where we were able to, you know, get more funds to the small businesses that had not uh, had access to uh, the loans that they thought they were going to get that were being implemented by the banks. Uh, and we were able to target some of that to our MDIs, that is our minority depository institutions, and our CDFIs. But then you came along and you added another opportunity for those uh, who were wishing to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program. And at one time we thought, oh my goodness, uh, you know, we're running out of money. But now we have uh, we have a generous amount of money uh, that still is available uh, for the PPP program and they can apply uh, in any number of ways. So if you have any observations or thoughts about, uh, you know, what we've done, how we've done it or how we can do it better, uh, I would appreciate it now. Yeah, and also too, thank you, uh, Maxine, for allowing my company to, you know, work with you, work with uh, Reverend Sharpton and also, you know, some incredible other companies. So we saw a need and we want to address that need. When we look up, man, African-Americans, we lost over 40% of all the black businesses, right? And that's, I think that was over 400,000 black owned businesses just had to close their doors. So we said, I, I looked up and said, I can't, I can't have that happen. So the first money we put up for the PPP program, we put up $100 million. We got well over 21,000 uh, applicants and people who needed money. And we were able to save thousands and thousands of businesses, both women owned, uh, black owned and Latino owned. And then we said that it went so well and we saved so many companies and employees who were able to keep their jobs and feed their families that I just put up another 225 million. So it brings the total to $325 million so that we can save other black owned businesses, women owned businesses, as well as Latino businesses. So that again, they can keep their employees, they can keep their doors open. And these businesses are important to the black community, to the Latino community. So. It's very important because um, we've counted on these businesses for 40, 50 years, you know, and so they've gotten passed on probably to their, their sons or daughters now. And so we're very happy to be a part of Equitrust, my company that I own. And as long as you're there, Maxine, helping us navigate through, we'll continue to help 
and uh, and Reverend Sharpton, we appreciate his effort as well. And so thank you and thank you and thank you. And thank you for everybody who applied for the loans because you're right, there's still money available. So don't give up. Make sure you go and apply for this PPP program because we know that the relationships with the banks and the credit unions made it not possible for black owned businesses or Latino owned businesses to, to, to get the loans. But now there's black owned businesses who have capital. So make sure you call the black owned banks in your community to access those loans to, and get that, that fund, those funds that are available for you. Thank you so much for all that you do. You know, we've talked about, and you were able to take us, you know, back into the NBA days, uh, with magic. And uh, we've talked about your entrepreneurship. And, you know, aside from being a great, uh, unbelievably superb athlete and a wonderful, talented, brilliant business person, you are a husband, you are a father, and um, you know, you said something after the police killings of George Floyd. You told CNN's and Anderson Cooper about the conversations you've had with your sons about how to act with the police. I think, and I can quote you said, I had that conversation because it's important that I have a conversation with both EJ and Andre. And so, you know, I just want to kind of wrap up with saying, Father, yes, I know that you've had to have these conversations and you worry every time they walk out the door uh, and other fathers are in the same position. So if there's anything you'd like to say as a father uh, to, you know, uh, be inspirational to all of the dads around the country and moms uh, uh, that are worried about what is going on, um, please uh, use this as an opportunity to just say whatever you'd like to say. Well, I first want to say just God bless everybody. Uh, I've leaned on the Lord during these tough times to help me to have these conversations with my two sons, EJ and Andre. And then I got a grandson now who is young. And, you know, you, you, you listen, my father had to have this conversation with me. And, and so every time even I'm Magic Johnson, I'm Urban Johnson, it didn't matter. When I see a police car, I still get nervous and I, and I have to, you know, do everything the right way to make sure, first, I don't get pulled over. Second, if I do get pulled over, my hands are on the steering wheel. I'm going to uh, abide by the commands and I'm, I'm gonna try to do everything the right way and, and any instructions that they give me, I'm gonna, uh, 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 make sure I comply with those instructions. And so make sure, uh, whether it's a father or a mother, you have those tough conversations with your son and your daughter as well. And, um, and make sure you help them understand, listen, it's, it's not a time to be a tough guy. Uh, uh, you're not gonna take it from the police or you're not gonna take crap from somebody. You have to, Put your guard down and just do what you're supposed to do to be here a long time. So, yes, it's tough times right now. Um, police brutality is running rapid through our country, especially with black men and, and black women. And we got to somehow bring a stop to that. But we have to also dialogue with our family to make sure we protect them, keep them safe. And I'm so happy that my father had those tough conversations just like I had to have with my son. And I still have, because every time they leave, go to New York, go somewhere, I'm calling them, okay, you, <laughs> you okay? You made it, you, you're doing the right thing. And because I want them to be here a long time. So um, I look forward to continue to be a voice in the black community and try to be one of the leaders in the black community. That's never gonna change. And uh, I just thank you, Maxine, for this platform. And just again, God bless everybody out there. Keep yourself safe and your family safe. And uh, I just hope that one day we don't have to have these conversations about, you know, people uh, disrespecting the black uh, community and uh, that we can just live free and we don't have to be scared about 
the moves that we make or or our actions or or you know just being here as a black man or a black woman and so i'm just i'm really just mad that we have to sit here and see so many unarmed young black men and women getting killed and uh also too that they try to say that uh through the protests that you know we were vandalizing in the beginning yes it was some of that but at the end it was all peaceful there were great young people out there protesting and they had a right to do that and so um again and it was all colors it just wasn't black it was that's all right. colors that's right of people out there protesting because they know right from wrong they knew it was wrong what happened to george floyd and i can keep going naming uh everybody so just God bless our community, and, and uh, I just hope that things get better in all sectors, whether that's police reform, whether that's in corporate America, because we we should be <clears throat> able to grow in a company. We should be able to be an executive at a company. We should be able to be on the board of directors at a company. We should be able to be the CEO of companies, on and on and on. And a lot of times we get passed over for people who uh, don't even have the qualifications that we have or hadn't been there that long. And so because of the color of our skin. So we want to make sure that these things stop happening uh, in our country. We just want a piece of the American dream like everybody else. Wow. You heard it from the mouth of Magic Irvin Johnson. We love you so much. I love you so much. I'm so appreciative for you and I'm so appreciative for the inspiration uh, that you have provided for so many people, young and old, uh, all colors, as you said. Um, and I'm so appreciative that you take time from your busy schedule to be with me today on an interview like this, when I know that there are a million other things that you could be doing. But the Congressional Black Caucus thanks you. Uh, and uh, this interview, is going to be one of the top moments of uh, <laughs> the uh, Congressional Black Caucus, Legislative Caucus this year. And of course, of course I'm gonna take credit for it. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> you better, you better. <laughs> hey, people, so don't thank know you. This. people don't know this. Now yeah. I'm gonna tell them right now. Okay. When Maxine Waters call, I pick up the phone. When Maxine <laughs> Waters say do something, I do it. Oh my God. I know that. <laughs> I love that. But now you're going to have a lot of people calling me saying, <laughs> now the calls are going to come in. Magic said he answers the phone for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has you been a wonderful welcome. time with you. I look mm -hmm. forward to seeing you and Cookie. And yep. I look forward to always uh, being able to have a moment with you. Uh, and I'm so again, pleased and proud about the outreach into our community that you've always done, the assistance, those jobs uh, that you're creating, that's everything. Yes. And your talk about moving up in the company to management positions, that's the kind of inspiration uh, that we all need to hear. And so again, my love and my thanks for being with us today. And I wish you all of the best of everything. Thank you. Thank you. And you too. I love you. And I call, I tell Bishop Blake that you said hello over oh, there. Please <laughs> tell the bishop. Please tell the bishop. And yeah. tell the bishop I'm going to come to the church soon. <laughs> okay, you got it. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>